The greatest adventure is what lies ahead. Today and tomorrow are yet to be said. Hello everyone, no one of consequence here, back again with a new video. I recently uploaded a video in which I was soliciting advice from viewers on other topics I can make videos about besides just recounting my Dungeons and Dragons campaign. And uh, two of the more popular responses that I got were videos on uh, DM advice and also product reviews and uh, even combining these two uh, specifically going over the old classic adventure modules and uh, how I uh, ran them for my own campaign so I could certainly do that and uh, so I thought what I'd do first is uh, cover the Temple of Elemental Evil and I did some of this in I put out some of this information in a video uh, in my, in my uh, campaign summary, but I thought I would revisit the topic and uh, try to expand upon that some. So that's what this first video is going to be. So of course, spoiler alert, I obviously will be revealing a lot of details found in this adventure module in this, uh, in this video. So as I mentioned in another video this module was published in 1985 of course over the decades since then volumes more information have been written about it so uh, what follows is how i ran my own campaign and much of it i got from other sources and i'll talk about those uh, some of it i came up with on my own and, you know, disclaimer, I don't claim that this is the right way to run this module or the only way to run it. You know, this is just how I did it. So maybe you can get some useful information out of it if you're going to run it yourself. But uh, in any case, this video is not going to make a lot of sense unless you have a copy of this adventure module that you can refer to. So the, the first thing I would advise is, if you can, try to obtain a copy of the original module, just T1, The Village of Hamlet. And um, the main reason is because it includes some more details about The Village of Hamlet that were not included in the Temple of Elemental Evil module. So it's not critical if you can't find it, you know, you can uh, get the PDF on Drive Through RPG, uh, so it's available. Um, so if you can, try to get a copy of it. Some uh, other additional material that I would recommend uh, can be found on the uh, Greyhawk Grognard website, and you can just uh, search for it online. It's easy to find. And he has a couple of free downloads, which I've pictured here, and. Um, the one on the left there is a, a prequel to the Temple of Elemental Evil, and then the other one uh, just expands on the temple, especially at the very end of that module. And it also includes some errata um, to correct some of the details from the original temple module. So both of these came out pretty much after I had already run the module myself in the videos which I cover in the video series but uh, I've looked through both of these are really solid products so I recommend you get those so moving on uh, of course the biggest change that I made in the module is that I got rid of the fungus demon Zuckdemoy and replaced her with the demon of sloth and of course the uh, as I covered before the reason I did that well, it's because that's how uh, Gary Gygax originally intended for it. And uh, he wrote on the topic a lot. And this is just one example that he wrote about. So um, anyway, that's my justification for making that change. So moving on, uh, let's talk about my uh, simplified history of the temple. So why do I need a simplified history? Well, the, the 
backstory of the temple is lengthy and it's complicated, a lot of details. And as I mentioned before, it's been added to over the years. And the, uh, in my opinion, the truth of the matter is most players are probably not even going to learn a lot of the backstory. And it, it, a lot of the details that they do uncover, they're probably going to have trouble remembering it. Um, it's just a simple fact that people are busy. And uh, like in my case with my players, they're all adults uh, with careers and family. Some are older like me, and they have children that are already grown and out of the house. Uh, one person has very young children. But they all have careers, you know, uh, government, white collar, blue collar. My my group covers the whole spectrum, and uh, but the one thing they all have in common is they're busy. And so, um, what I've my goal is to just try to distill everything down into only the most essential details that uh, they might need for everything in this adventure to make sense. So, uh, uh, review that. So, start off with a Drowy Clavdra, and let me just say, uh, you're, I'm going to say Drow, that's how we always pronounced it, and I'm not going to stop. I know the popular pronunciation is Drow, but uh, if you go back through old references, uh, either pronunciation can be considered correct, and I'm going to say Drow. So anyway, the uh, Drowy Clavdra, leader of the House Alserv, rebelled against Loth and began worshipping Loth's ancient enemy, the Elder Elemental God. The Clavdra's goal was to convert all Drow to the worship of the Elder Elemental God and become their absolute ruler. So the first thing she uh, decided to do was establish a presence on the surface world and gain more power before moving against her enemies in the Drow homeland, and this led to her creation of the Temple of Elemental Evil. And another thing that she did, uh, Eclavdra formed an alliance with Ayus, who already has a kingdom in the world of Greyhawk. And if you look at a, uh, a map of the world of Greyhawk, you'll see Ayus' kingdom there in kind of the north-central part of the, of the map. So Loth saw all of this developing, and she, rightly so, considered it a serious threat to her rule over the Dro. So she finally decided to leave the Abyss and go to the temple to confront Eclavdra directly. The only thing was when, she, when Loth got there, uh, Eclavdra was not at the temple, and uh, she didn't want to risk offending Ayus by attacking his worshippers, so she decided to wait in disguise at the temple for Eclavdra to return. Um, unfortunately for her, the high priest of Veluna and Furiandi became aware that Loth had left the abyss and come to Earth in the world of Greyhawk. The part that they got wrong was they mistakenly believed that she had gone to the temple to lead its forces in a war against them. So the forces of good decided to strike first, which culminated in the Battle of Emerity Meadows, and there's plenty of information out there about that. But the end result was that the temple was overthrown and the Loth was imprisoned within its dungeon. So there is where I get rid of Zuck Moy and switch it back to Loth. So that's my simplified history. So what about the uh, status of the temple today? And by today I mean at whatever point in your campaign when your player characters arrive there. Um, well, some of the changes I made to that, uh, first of all, Loretha the Beautiful, who's in the Moat House, it, he only pretends to be an Elder Elemental God cleric, but in reality, he is a follower of Loth, and I uh, cut out the uh, blocks of text in both the module T1 and T1-4. Um, they both say that Loretha is a uh, cleric of Loth, and you know, it could be argued that, well, that's just errata from uh, when Gygax originally wrote it. And uh, 
Loth was still there, but it, it should be that Loreth worships Zuckmoy. Um, but yeah, I got rid of Zuckmoy. Loth is back, and uh, so it uh, makes uh, sense that he could be a follower of Loth. Um, we also have uh, what I another thing that I changed is that Loreth uh, secretly reports to Falrenth at the temple, uh, who is another false elder elemental god worshipper, and who actually serves Loth. And that is in the module. Uh, Falrenth is um, a follower of Loth, even with Zuktamoy being there. But uh, in any case, uh, they both secretly want to free Loth from her prison within the temple. So if the uh, characters uh, defeat Loreth, then uh, they might find papers in his personal quarters and make reference to all this. Or if they uh, manage to capture him alive, then he might be made to confess to his true allegiance and motivations for being in the temple. Meanwhile, Eclavdra, um, her prolonged absence from the temple is due to her efforts to recruit giants of the surface world. And, you know, that's the part of the campaign that comes after the temple. And uh, But she also keeps having to defend her power base back in the Dro homeland. So because of all that, she's just not been around the temple much in a long time. So, uh, in Eclavdor's absence, in the absence of Eclavdor's strong leadership, uh, elemental factions of the temple fight amongst themselves for dominance, and they also seek to curry favor with the temple leaders that are there down on level four. And meanwhile, Ayus continues to support the temple in Eclavdor's absence because it is a useful tool in his ongoing wars against the nations of Valuna and Furiandi. And uh, Ayaz would also like to recover the Orb of Golden Death, uh, which went missing after the Battle of Emerity Meadows. Uh, he invested a lot of his power in the creation of that artifact, and he would like to get it back. Uh, Ayaz knows that the orb is located somewhere within the temple, but he just he doesn't know exactly where it is. So another big change I made to the uh, module is these elemental nodes, which uh, the characters would normally get to later in the adventure. And uh, the whole point of these nodes is only uh, to provide a means for the players to obtain these items called the elemental gems. But uh, from the early days of running this module, not long after it came out, uh, consistently it felt like by the time the players would get to the point where they would access these nodes, they're starting to get m adventure module fatigue as they will have been at this uh, module for quite some time by then. And uh, so really these, my experience was these uh, nodes, these elemental nodes were really just a an unnecessary slog that bogged the whole thing down. So what I did uh, was that instead the characters could obtain the elemental gems by destroying the worship altars in each of the elemental factions on levels 1 and 2. And uh, this points out where the altar is located on level 1 for the Earth Temple. And then here, this map just shows on level two, uh, from left to right, the altars for the water, air, and fire temples. So I, I didn't really have any specific method planned out um, that the players have to use to destroy the elemental altars. I just thought, you know, any reasonable combination of physical blows, you know, probably with magic weapons, uh, Magic spells, you know, like Bless, for example, and using things such as Holy Water, any of that would work. Uh, but whatever they did, once the 
one of the uh, altars is destroyed, the characters would find the corresponding elemental gem amongst the altar shattered remnants. So by doing it that way, I completely eliminated the need for these uh, elemental nodes. So another problem was that uh, as the module's written, it's very unlikely that the characters would ever be able to access the sealed area that occupies the northern third of level three. And um, of course, this is the, uh, the prison where, in my case, Loth is trapped. So uh, there is a door leading to that um, area, but the module explains uh, how difficult it is to break through them. And this isn't uh, the only door. There, there are multiple doors that are all the same that uh, would have to be breached. And uh, anyway, it's extremely unlikely that the characters would ever be able to uh, to get through them. So uh, what I did was I included a different way of accessing that area, but uh, possession of all four of the elemental gems is required to do it. And what I uh, did, I added a secret door that connected the areas 322 and 339 and pointed out there on the map. And uh, it's, like I say, it's just a secret door that opens into a passage connecting those two areas. And the mechanism is that uh, you have to have all four of the elemental gems. You insert the gems into sockets. And uh, if you do that, then the door unlocks and the characters can get in there so and that's exactly how it played out in my campaign so another uh, part of this module that's important is finding prince thrommel and you know he's in he's important to the long-term campaign if you're uh, gonna keep going after the temple and in the module, he is hidden away in this room, pointed out on the map, and you know he's being held in a uh, like a, a stasis. And uh, but it's important for the characters to find him. So uh, as you can see here on the map, uh, there's a arrow pointing to there's a secret door uh, that has to be discovered to access the area where Prince Thrommel is. Problem is, there's really no real reason for the characters even to be looking for a secret door there. And and I referenced this before, and I can't remember where exactly I read it. But somewhere along the way, I read something that essentially said, don't, don't hide a major plot device behind a secret door. And the reason being is there's a good chance your players will miss it, and then you've got to... If you really want them to find whatever it is, then you've got to readjust everything so that they can find it. So what I did, I just got rid of it as a secret door and made it a standard door, but it was heavily barred and sealed with silver. And uh, when the characters find that, it should be obvious to them that something important is located behind it. Um... What I, I did leave the second secret door in place, and that's pointed out here on the map. And uh, just the room, room 333, the room's odd shape should suggest to the characters that something's not quite right here. And I included a screenshot of my own players when they went through here. And uh, in fact, they, they did in fact find that secret door hidden uh, in this room. So once the characters get through that secret door, um, they they find the chamber where Prince Thrommel is uh, being kept. And uh, of course, in the module, uh, there's a vam a vampire illusion concealing Prince Thrommel's true nature. And as it's written, the whole thing's invisible. But I got rid of the invisibility effect, but I left the vampire illusion and. Again, here's a screenshot of when my own uh, players found this area. So the module text describes, quote, powerful magics that the characters can use to dispel the vampire illusion, but 
in my opinion, it's not really fair because if you're if you're running this module as written, the characters don't get access to any of these so-called powerful magics that are needed to dispel the illusion. So instead, as I write there on the uh, uh, screen, uh, typical vampire tropes apply. If the characters check for it, uh, the body does not radiate evil. If they think to hold up a mirror to it, it casts a reflection. If they were to use holy water or touch a holy symbol to the body, it has no ill effects. And so all of these things, um, if any of these things or all of these things are done, it should strongly suggest to the characters that things are not as they seem. And in fact, all they have to do is uh, just, uh, I think I forgot to mention it, but there's a wooden stake uh, driven into this vampire illusion. All they have to do is pull out the wooden stake and the uh, vampire illusion disappears and then they see Pritz Thrommel as uh, he actually looks and he also soon wakes up from this uh, stasis that he's in. So moving on, um, this uh, room on the second level, room 207, it's called the Pearlescent Room, and you can consult the module to read the details. But uh, in my opinion, no, no players worth their salt would fall for the premise of this encounter. It's uh, pretty uh, far-fetched. So uh, I just got rid of those details. I kept the werewolves themselves, which are hidden in room 208. Um, but uh, the reason, I, uh, from my reasoning that they're located here, is they're part of, they belong to the Fire Temple faction. But the uh, other Fire Temple servants don't really like the idea of having werewolves living amongst them. So uh, the werewolves live here in room 208. And uh, back to room 207, like I say, I got rid of those details. And it's uh, simply an empty room into which the werewolves can spy. And uh, the characters might be fooled into thinking it's a safe place to rest. And if they were to do that then the werewolves could sneak in and hopefully catch the characters off guard. But even if the characters don't stop in room 207 and continue on, the, uh, the werewolves will stop the characters in wolf form. Well, one of them will, uh, while the other werewolf uh, goes off to warn the fire temple leaders of the character's presence. So, uh, moving on, now we're down on uh, level 3, and uh, specifically room 310, the so-called sunlit room pointed out here on the map. So, in my opinion, this encounter is even more unbelievable than the werewolf room, and uh, it's really it's just a big waste of time. You can read those details in the module. So instead, I just changed this room to be a prisoner holding area slash torture chamber, which is run by the temple leaders. And um, any uh, characters or major NPCs that might be captured by the temple forces in the course of the adventure would eventually end up here in this room, where they would be held for questioning by the temple leaders. And uh, if that were to happen, then it could... Uh, lead to a fun and challenging rescue mission that the characters have to undertake. So another area in uh, the third level, room 338, and this is where the module is written. This is where the uh, Orb of Golden Death is hidden. And uh, this item combined with the elemental gems, uh, the whole thing becomes a very powerful artifact of evil. But uh, as you can see here on this map, uh, it's a major plot device, but it's uh, concealed by not one, but three secret doors. And uh, thus making it uh, very unlikely that uh, the characters would ever actually find it. So uh, what I did, I decided to make the, this orb a so-called floating item. And uh, depending on where the characters go and what they do, um, then they could possibly discover this item. And how it 
worked up worked out in my campaign I ended up putting uh, the orb in uh, this area pointed out here on the map because uh, it's already a heavily trapped location and there are other valuable magic items hidden there as well so that was where I put the orb of golden death in my campaign and the characters did eventually find it but I mean, if you're if you have players that are exceptionally clever and they do happen to find that location where Falrinth lives then uh, you know great then you can keep the orb in that location and your players can find it there so uh, another change in room 339 there's these elemental portals and um, the three or I'm sorry the four elemental portals in this room connect to corresponding portals down on the fourth level in uh, 421, 425, 428, and 430, 432. And, uh, but the, these portals are currently inactive. Um, the reason I had uh, made that change was uh, in the module is written, those portals connect to the elemental nodes, but I got rid of the elemental nodes. And so I changed it to where they connect to portals on the fourth level, but the whole thing's currently inactive. And uh, this just shows um, on the uh, fourth level where those uh, portals would normally connect to. And uh, back in the temple's heyday when uh, everything was active, sacrifices uh, to the elemental factions uh, that were made in room that room 339 would be transported here to these nodes on the fourth level that I've pointed out. And then uh, these victims were taken over to the portals on the uh, on the east side of the map, which I've pointed out. And anything thrown into those portals, uh, they tri uh, connect to the actual elemental planes and the sacrifices made there uh, for the Elder Elemental God. And then the uh, priests of Ayus, who were also down here, would take a share of the sacrifices and take them to their altar in room 433, pointed out here on the map. And uh, those sacrifices were, uh, were in payment for their uh, support of the temple. So again, I made, uh, going back up to the third level, I, uh, I made these portals in room 339 inactive so that, uh, mainly so the characters couldn't just jump ahead into level four, which as you can see, they uh, could do if they were, if they were still active. So moving on, um, another change if the characters do get down to the fourth level and uh, access those uh, portals to the elemental planes in those room numbers there, uh, the portals can be destroyed by the characters they throw uh, the corresponding elemental gem into the appropriate portal. And uh, this screenshot here is just one from my campaign summary showing when the... Uh, Characters, uh, just in this case, were destroying the uh, elemental plane of air. And then if the uh, characters destroy all four of the uh, elemental portals, then uh, these four elemental keys appear on the main altar, which is pointed out on this map. And uh, this is important. The... Uh, the possession of these elemental keys become important uh, much later in the campaign. Oh, moving on, at the very end of the module, in the uh, area 435, the light chamber, I, uh, I really I just tossed most of those details as written in the module because they sent around Zuckmoy, who of course I'd gotten rid of. And the uh, the specifics of this area are sketchy and lost in time but the main point is that this column of light is generated by a partial manifestation of the elder elemental god 
when he was worshipped here eons ago. And uh, I didn't just make all that up. Uh, that actually comes from uh, Gary Gygax himself. And uh, the, uh, the web zine Earth Journal covers that in this particular issue. And I've done a screen grab of the relevant text there you can review. So what I uh, decided was that um, the uh, Ayas, when he created the Orb of Golden Death, he uh, harnessed uh, not only his own power, but uh, some of the Elder Elemental God's power to create uh, the Orb of Golden Death. And so the uh, final task for the characters is to destroy that item by tossing it into the light column. And uh, this screenshot here just shows a point in time when uh, the characters in my campaign did that exact thing through the orb of golden death into the light column. And uh, destroying the orb of golden death releases the power harnessed by o Ios to uh, help create the temple structure itself. So when the uh, orb is destroyed, the whole place begins to crumble and collapse around the characters, and they have to flee uh, to survive. And uh, I, had, I had decided that as long as the characters don't delay, then uh, they would successfully escape from the collapsing temple, even if they have to physically run all the way back to the surface level. And uh, in, in my opinion, the... Uh, this bringing about the complete destruction of the temple gives the players a satisfying conclusion to the adventure that, that I felt was missing from the module as written. And then uh, one final note that I would say, uh, you know, of course, I, I run my campaign on Roll20. Um, but even if you uh, don't... Um, if you have can access some kind of a, a VTT layout, even for just a face-to-face -face tabletop game, um, in my opinion, it helps a lot. And this is just a screen grab of the, uh, I think, level, first level from, uh, from my Roll20 game. And, um, you know, back in the early days when... I was just running this adventure from the from the module itself. It was it was hard sometimes to visualize where everything was located and all the different rooms and their occupants and how they relate to one another. But uh, in this uh, VTT format, uh, no matter where the characters were, it was easy for me to you know kind of zoom out, see where everything was. Uh, you know, if the characters got into a battle, then uh, it was easy to visualize, you know, how far uh, possibly would the sounds of that battle carry and thus perhaps alert other occupants and so forth. And um, so anyway, I just found it, uh, it just really put a whole new perspective on it for me by uh, using this format. It was just made it a lot easier to run in my opinion so uh, again even if you're not running a game online and uh, you're doing it face to face uh, using some tool like this can really help uh, I think to run the uh, adventure as a whole alright well that's all I have for now uh, if you enjoyed the video please hit the like button as always if you have not yet uh, please consider subscribing uh, leave a comment. Let me know what you think of this kind of video. And if you can, share the video if uh, you know of somewhere where you think other people might like it. And uh, anything you do to help support the channel, I appreciate it. Thanks again. Bye for now. Baby.